do it around our Arash zine, and um, the zine is a big part of what we do. And a few months ago, um, a few of us went down to the DIY Cultures event in down in East London, which is an amazing kind of centre of distribution for the young zine makers in London. And um, we went down there, we hadn't booked anything, but we dropped a few zines off, and suddenly we found this space where you could leave zines, you could talk to zine makers, and you can, you can read about me, um, read about my time there in the magazines. It's quite a fantastic experience. And uh, so we asked uh, two of the creators to come down to discuss with us about the, uh, the events there, along with, um, is it Unk or O-O-N-K? <laughs> with another team maker, um, Unk, which um, is also on sale here. It's a uh, fantastic team, very interesting, probably better production values than ours. Um, <laughs> but we try our best. Let me, uh, let me sit down. So yeah, so these questions are going to kind of revolve around zines and things like that. Um, there seems to be a large spectrum of publications that call themselves zines. So, I mean, I was in Foils last weekend and there are photo zines for 35 quid, which is an awful lot <laughs> for something, you know, which has a certain underground route. And I was interested is, you know, what is special about a DIY zine? And uh, how does it differ from these other more glossy publications? Do you see a difference? Is there uh, a kind of degree of zine? Is there a flash zine and a, and a you know, Xerox punk zine? Please, yeah. I think what's um, interesting about DIY zines is that there's nobody there to tell you that you can't do something, you can't make something. So everybody, if they're an artist, a writer, a poet, can just go along and sort of write their own stuff or create their own pictures and put it in a publication and just put it out into the world. And I think that that's what differentiates DIY from mainstream publications. Also, another thing that I think is important is that because you have that sort of autonomy and independence, you're actually able to sort of have a wider spectrum of viewpoints sort of uh, presented to you in through zine fairs and through these small press publications than you otherwise would do in mainstream media. Uh, I, I just want to say as well, um, not a, a 35 pounds can seem a lot, but again, because Zines is an uh, autonomous press, that's really the thing that what we love about it, that we're, you're creating your own publication. So if your labour is worth 35 pounds and someone is willing to pay 35 pounds, then go for it. I'm not going to hate on you. <laughs> Although, I have to say, you can also get Ook in foils and it's 75 pounds. But, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, Zines as opposed to magazines are ostensibly self read what makes them real is the fact that they're self-published whereas magazines often come within a sort of greater publishing consortium and there may be um, so many other interest advertisers or other industries that this is a vehicle to share their work whereas zines is much more the autonomous voices of of writers of artists being able to share their their work so i think that's really what sets apart zines from other types of publications Okay, I mean, moving on, who, who are producing fanzines, in your view, in London? I mean, who are these people, and who are buying them as well? Um, I think any, any enthusiast of any particular um, cultural medium, be it music, be it poetry, be it art, can produce a fanzine. Sometimes it's the creators themselves that produce fanzines, and often it's like the grassroots organisations and people who are who are sort of just starting out in the industry that, that sort of get together and, and much like yourselves, have work in little collectives and sort of produce a publication. And that's how the news spreads and, and that's a really good sort of alternative sort of news outlet, I think, for all this kind of culture. I, I also think a lot of the people who produce scenes are just unemployed art students. <laughs> Nothing wrong <laughs> with that again. Um, including myself. Um, and a lot of people producing the people who don't want to grow up because you're making things with felt tips, with scissors and cut and glue. And a lot of people who make zines um, don't like technology either. Um, so there's this ethic of Ludditeism in the whole thing too. Um, the thing we have in DIY culture is we try and have a sort of participatory economy um, to use that autonomous anarchist uh, uh, So people who came, I mean, we're going for like... Um, two years or three years because it started life as a tutor and zine fair and um, so people who um, attend like last year end up being on the stage next year um, so 
Um, I, I mean, talking about these £35 zines, I mean, they're more from this other zine fair, which isn't as good as ours, called Published and Be Damned, run by my ex-tutor at Royal College of Art. Um, and um, he has this, so this is this goldsmith Shoreditch wanky um, colonisation of the zine world, um, which I wholeheartedly reject. And I used to, this other zine fair, they used to reject me, so because they reject me, I, we did our own zine fair, which is better than theirs. And, doesn't have this wanky, um, like, Shoreditch type thing. Um, the other thing we try to do, like, I, I have a particular bone to pick with white exclusivity and white power, and I'm, I was an art student and I was part of the art world, so, you know, it speaks for itself, right? Um, and so I found the places where you had independent art spaces and so-called autonomous work were, um, they're in areas like Tower Hamlets, uh, Peckham, Deptford, so the most diverse majority black and Asian areas. Um, you had these horrible spaces like Auto Italia and other spaces like that. And um, the, these spaces, even they had this sort of pretensions of being non-hierarchical and um, autonomous and all this sort of left wing type vocabulary. They were more white exclusive and they were more elitist and they were more cliquey than um, a lot of public spaces. And then on the other hand, you had um, so there's distrust of those people, naturally. So, um, um, on the other hand, you had this sort of um, over-bureaucratic, over-professionalised um, way of doing what you call diversity management. Um, so, I mean, it's significant. We're in Rich Mix, which is one of the most, like, you know, horrible corporate ethnic type things. Um, and um, so it was a way of doing a, a, a sort of genuinely grassroots participatory... Um, way, so I mean the way DIY culture started is because I used to go to the uh, London Zine Symposium and I was the only non-white person there and um, I met um, Sophia who's not with us today, who was this Pakistani hijabi, uh, very devout um, Muslim girl um, who was also making scenes and she was making scenes about hijabs called scarf face and um, <laughs> social not working and so forth. Um, and, and then, so every time I met a person of colour at a zine fair, I mean this zine fair was in like Brick Lake, but everyone was white, yeah, apart from me. And um, so, yeah, so every time I met a person of colour, we I wanted us to like become sort some sort of guerrilla army, so we could um, usurp white supremacy and have this world order. Yeah, um, <laughs> which is really noble, and again, wholeheartedly agree with these. Um, uh, the view. So DIY cultures, as we said, set in rich mix. Um, it's completely free scene fair. Um, so it meant that we really wanted to make sure that everybody could come in and involve themselves. Um, as we were talking about participatory econ uh, economies. I mean, it. You know, we you you spent. I sent it five pounds for a table that you wanted to bring your zines, and but you can sell it, and however much you want to sell it for, you get that money back. Um, but at the heart of DIY cultures, which I think makes different to other zine fairs, is that we have talks. So this year, I did one of the talks with um, sort of uh, black feminists and um, sort of lonely Londoners who are fantastic uh, art collectives, and you should guys sort of uh, find them on um, decolonize it yourself. So we were talking about. Um, the politics of decolonization and um, specifically in the art world. So we had um, Aurelia Youssef who's um, sort of um, looking at uh, black women's contribution to um, the uh, European art um, sort of scene as it were. And you know I was talking about the work of Amir Césaire and we had um, sort of talking about uh, different writers and the people that influenced us. And I think the talks is what make DIY cultures Awesome. So we had other people talking about craftivism, sort of using their art to talk about their activism and whatnot. So um, yeah, again, and it was free, and we had loads of brown people in there. I was like the brownest that Rich Mix has ever been. And, yeah. <laughs> we're, the only, we're the only zine fair that will have, will have like a prayer room. In <laughs> um, yeah, it's not um, and the whole. We explore what this word DIY means. I mean, you have the punk rock ethic, but. As I said, there's things like Ludditeism. I mean, you're basically questioning two things. One's the state, and like most of us who run it are Muslims, so naturally we're distrustful of the state. And, um, yeah, especially after, you know, yeah, the I mean, we like, like, you know, we, we, if we ask for funding, we're asked to, like, made to prove that we're moderates so, like, and <laughs> not contributing towards terrorism. Um, and then we're distrustful of corporations because um, they're 
corporations. <laughs> and, um, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm actually an art curator, sorry. Um, I, I actually formally trained to be a curator, I think, which was one of the worst years of my life. <laughs> and um, there, there's this over-professionalisation of curating with all this sort of Zizeki and Deleuze bubble goldsmith rubbish, sorry. And uh, so, I mean, uh, DIY culture's way of being uh, more down to earth and so on. I mean, that, that poses the question, the kind of the spectre of the internet. What is your relationship with the internet? You know, Luddism, yes, you can, you can smash the, the machinery in the mills, but unfortunately, you know, there is a, a level of participation even in the production of the magazine, in the production of your website, which is totally kind of complicit, and it's negotiating those, those problems when you're trying to generate a resistant space that is, I see, problematic. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think we... Uh... We use the internet, so we, lots of people found out about our zine fair from Facebook, and we've got a Tumblr. I love Tumblr, I'm not gonna lie. But I do believe the internet will die, and all our work. They'll say about our generation, oh, you know, I think they did things, but we just found these boxes, and I think they were called routers, but you know, we don't actually know what they did. So, um, yeah, so like, that's why we produce things, like physical pavements, because there's something so beautiful about just seeing something in print and, and flicking um, through and I mean, sharing it with your friend. Yeah, we also have a hashtag as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, weird. I mean, it's the same with vinyl, like actually, um, it, it's weird, I mean when I was 13 year old, years old and making zines with my dad's photocopier, I used to sell zines for one pound and it's like the value of things actually go up. I mean it's the same with vinyl, like a vinyl record, you know. You, uh, so I mean, uh, so, so, um, Selling out, talking about monetary value. <laughs> um, so actually, um, it's strange actually because the the explosion of zine culture is now bigger now than ever. Strangely, with the internet and stuff, I guess like one the sense of exhaustion and uh, it's nice to meet people face to face and use scissors and glue and a stapler. Yes. And, and the internet helps you see those people or find those people that you can then meet face to face and share your self-made magazine. So yeah, I mean, it, it maybe feels like a sellout, but I don't know. I feel all of us are complicit in something. So um, we, we just sold out, yeah. Yeah, we sold out, yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, that that kind of returns me back to my my favourite word, distribution. And you know, that's where I think what you do is very important because you can be photocopying off your dad's photocopy and plugging them down the market but that's never going to get the wider distribution and I'm interested how can you further those distributed methods how can you how can you broaden the means of production ethically in quotation marks um, within you know our contemporary world how do we how do you distribute more than DIY cultures? Where will you go? What can you do? Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe yeah. like um, what what zine fairs in general provide is an alternative marketplace, as it were, for um, the the distribution of all these different art forms. So obviously, you know, you can you sell these online and on the internet. But as Suda said, you you can't really meet these people face to face and talk to them like, about this stuff sort of as as, as socially as easily. Uh, in, in person, in fairs, it, it's much better, much easier to do that. And so I think there is a kind of counter-consumerist culture going on there, definitely within Zine Fair, and I think that's a good thing. It's like it, it goes with all the sort of independent makers and independent shops, that kind of ethic. I think it sort of fits in towards that, but obviously it has a has a DIY culture in general has a, a longer history, obviously with the arts and arts and punk movement as well. So there's always that sort of element of doing something new and, and going against the mainstream and sort of just slightly anti-capitalist in a way but I think that's a good thing because it sort of diversifies the types of people that you reach and the, 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 mar the markets are sort of diversified as well I think that's good. So. And uh, just to follow on from that it, I mean, I don't think that it would work it just to, to produce to lots of people, as it were, if that ethic behind it, if the understanding of what this is, is lost in the transmission. So it's as much of meeting people at a zine fair, seeing people, or meeting it in, a, in the right context. So, I mean, Oomk is sold in uh, a few stores and online, but there are places that we wouldn't want it to be sold at because I don't think that they get the, what we're about. So maybe that might be pretentious or, you know, whatever. And like I said, we haven't sold out yet, but... <laughs> As it stands, you know, like, yeah, if it doesn't get to everyone, 
you know, I want people to make their own things. They don't want Oog or, you know, any other zine to be like the voice for, you know, alternative cultures or whatnot. We want to, and I think that's what we found is people come see us and think, oh, that's so interesting. I want to do one. And then you've got lots of people doing their own local zine fairs. I mean, there was one, yeah. It's like, why, why do you need like a centralized authority to like just replicate and reproduce itself? Like, as I said, if someone comes there, they produce their own thing, and then that's how, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we have workshops it, yeah. as well, yeah. so people can actually come, and one of the workshops this year was actually making your own scene, making your own sort of little book publication, so we, we encourage the public to participate, and anybody who doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily interested in making it to participate as well, just for the day as well. So it might inspire them to do more things, which I think is a good on that note, do we have any questions from anyone? Okay, I'm quite curious. Do you, you have a, in terms of what you do, do you have a, an, ob, an objective an, an objective to what you do, a particular message? I think he said it. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> sort of smashing down sort of like anti-black racism and white supremacy and anti-capitalism and making this place where everyone can live and breathe, you know, without feeling like the... Yeah, the world is crashing down on them. So we had, for example, uh, we had a talk on uh, mental health, uh, for example, and like that, that's you know we just want to share. Like, I mean, it's not us instigating a lot of things. A lot of things are already happening. So, I um, mean, the, the Occupy movement, which is another form of autonomous organisation, is has been integrated and come to DIY there. And um, so, um, I mean, the particular talk about mental health that was done by Occupy. Uh, London um, and um, yeah, what, what are any, what are trying to do? Um, I don't. I mean, it, it is people. I mean, I mean, going back to this thing about people don't grow up as well. Though, I mean, like um, it doesn't. Um, I know. I think everybody who makes these does have this little bit of grandiosity about it. I mean, ultimately, we don't really change anything. Oh, I think he's being unfair. Okay, so everybody comes with their own aims, and um, yeah. It's community building. You know what I was saying, because you mentioned yeah. a bit about exclusivity, like, you mentioned everything. Uh, the, the sort of zine fair you went to, yeah. of the dominantly white. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether your motive is particularly to conquer that, or is your motive is whatever it is, and that just happens to be the case. I think that is part of it, but also it's it's creating something as I said, which is inclusive. So I think it's it's creating something non-hierarchical. For example, we also do like workshops and exhibitions, and the, in the exhibitions we had um, students and sort of very very young sort of emerging artists uh, participated in making book book works it, alongside like people who had like exhibited in the Tate and like the Berlin, Berlin Biennale and things like that. So it's like, you know, being able to include all different kinds of people and be non-hierarchical about it. And, and to have fun as well. Yes. <laughs> just, just quickly, is there a 2015 DIY Cultures? Is it in the mix? Uh, the next DIY Cultures is going to be in May 2015. Yeah. Oh. Um, uh, so it occurs once a year. Um, yeah, it comes once a year. You'll we'll, we'll share. You're, you're you guys invited. definitely going to be there. You know, yeah. we love your Thank stuff. You. So, and you know, any of you guys as well, if you want to come, we'll have the Tumblr will be off. Uh, we had a big debate actually. What's what's going to happen? So DIY cups might sell out next year because we're actually going to yeah. we're actually going to go for a uh, state funding. Um, just just because of the Ooh. Yeah. Just because of the state too. of poverty I'm in mean, and um, my mother my mother feeling deeply ashamed of me. <laughs> <laughs> well if we can thank the, the wonderful <laughs> DIY coaches for <laughs> And there was plenty of things for you to buy. So you've got to keep this participative economy going. So I would get over there and buy something. <laughs> thank you, we're gonna be about ten.